audience, thanks everyone for coming. So today we have Marty Perano Lobet from, um, so he did his PhD in Antonia Assen's group in Barcelona. Then he did a postdoc um, Munich Max Planck Institute. And he's now an Abitionis Fellow at Geneva nearby. And today he's going to talk to us about quantum metrology. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the invitation. It's really nice to be here. Thanks a lot also for everyone coming, despite the weather and the many viruses that, <laughs> that are around these days. So today, indeed, I'll be talking about quantum metrology. Um, so the idea a bit that, that we will have during this talk is that we want to measure a small signal, say a magnetic field, and for this we will use a, a quantum probe or a quantum sensor. So we have in mind like a small system, like a small atomic system, or a few or many atoms. Okay? And uh, when you talk about quantum metrology, the kind of um, words that come to your mind is the Heisenberg limit and uh, also quantum entanglement. Okay, so the main idea here is that if, for example, we, we would measure each of these atoms uh, individually, so we would repeat the experiment many times on independent systems, then the precision <coughs> of the measurement is limited by the shot noise limit. Okay. But still, it's well known, and, and this is kind of a seminal result, that we can exploit quantum entanglement to enhance the precision <coughs> of those measurements and go towards the Heisenberg limit. Now, I mean, this is really nice, but of course, in reality, this is very challenging, okay? Because usually this quantum probe, first, it's very hard to prepare entangled states of, of many particles, so scalability is a big challenge. And then also, usually, this probe is not uh, isolated, but is in contact with an environment. Okay, so we have the coherence, we have dissipation. So usually what happens uh, in any, in most of the practical uh, implementations is that because of the presence of the environment, I mean, this entanglement uh, is destroyed. And actually there are very uh, um, strong uh, <coughs> results, like analytic results that basically tell you that in the presence of, of noise or an environment, we always lose this Heisenberg uh, scaling, and we are always limited to the short noise limit, eventually, okay, for n large enough. So even if for a small n, uh, we start having the advantage, because of the presence of noise, usually this advantage is lost, okay? Now, what I will be considering in this talk is what happens, so the picture I gave before is really when you think that you have independent particles, okay, they are correlated to quantum states, but they don't interact, okay? Now, what I will be considering in this talk instead is that we have interactions between the particles. And it's kind of clear that this changes the rules of the game, because to begin with, if we have interactions, it might be, so there is this idea of dissipation as a resource, so it can be that because of the presence of interactions, the, the, the steady state, of, uh, of your Markovian or your, your equation actually has entanglement. So there might be entanglement even in the, in the steady state. Okay, so you kind of see that we can still preserve entanglement even in the presence of noise. And not only that, but more generally, the presence of interactions open really a lot of new phenomena. <coughs> and one of the most important for, for sensing are phase transitions. Of course, quantum phase transitions, but we could also have dissipative of thermal phase transitions. And these phase transitions can really be exploited for sensing. And again, the idea is very, is very clear. So basically, you can, by changing, a, it can be that by changing a bit the signal, there is a big change in the state of the probe because you are close to a phase transition. Okay? Now, what is also important to, to point out is that the moment <coughs> we have interaction, this very simple picture, okay, where you have shot noise limit for classical states and where you can use quantum entanglement to go to Heisenberg scaling, is it becomes blurry, okay? It's less clear what is it that is the origin of the advantage. It's less clear if it's really entanglement or so 
things become more more involved and I think still not say fully clear and in this talk I want to also contribute a bit to, 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 to this understanding um, and indeed what I was saying okay for example if we have phase transition just to give an idea I mean many classical sensors are based on this okay so this is not really a quantum thing okay so this idea of putting a system close to phase transition is used classically and now there is also interest in the community to use it for for small quantum systems okay so these are some some representative words but of course there are many other but basically the idea is to to see if we can exploit criticality for for quantum systems. <coughs> there's also becoming to be the first experiments about this so there's quite a lot of activity to understand quantum metrology with with interacting quantum systems okay um, a bit what are the challenges so of course I'm biased by being a <laughs> theoretist also more I come more from the quantum information community but okay clearly one big challenge okay yeah, so probably the most important one is we want to move beyond these theoretical proposals and proof of principle experiments and show that these ideas can be useful in practice um, this will not be addressed here unfortunately but I will be looking more at what I was mentioning before. So we want to understand a bit what are the fundamental <coughs> limits at the moment we have interactions of the probe. Okay. Because, okay, sorry if it's a bit uh, not very clear, but every now and then you see a paper that claims a super Heisenberg scaling. Okay, so when you start having interactions, there's also sometimes it, it seems like you could even go beyond Heisenberg, okay? <coughs> And these things um, yeah, are, are now becoming more clarified, but it's still not clear. Um, also, it's interesting if we have some control on these interactions, how to optimally engineer them. And OK, also to see what are the bottlenecks or, or the problems that also arise by the presence of interactions. Okay. So now, in this talk, what I will be considering is kind of a really an opposite. So in Usually in quantum metrology, you, you assume a lot of control on the state. So you can assume that you can prepare a fully entangled state, a very delicate quantum state. Here, in this talk, I will really go to the opposite extreme. So I will be considering that the state that we use for metrology is really the, not like the most uh, useless or the, if you want, the state with the most entropy. Uh, so basically a, a Gibbs state, okay, so a thermal state. So I will be considering really, the, in a way, the most useless state, apparently, but show that you can still do interesting protocols in metrology the moment that you have interactions, okay? If you don't have interactions, it's clear that this is useless because it's, well, useless, I mean, you can still use it, but it's, I mean, it's not going to give you any collective advantage. But I will consider here what happens when you have interactions. So I will be always in a Gibbs state. And then what I will show is that um, actually we can find a general bound on the measurement precision using thermal probes and quite interestingly I, I shouldn't <laughs> call it maybe Heisenberg limit but you can also get a quadratic uh, <coughs> scaling with a number of particles okay? so by, by engineering the interactions here and if they are strong enough you can reach also a precision in the measurement that goes over 1 over n but we will see that this doesn't come from entanglement, but really about the presence of interactions. Because in fact, this will be a classical result. Then I will show how to use this for measuring uh, either magnetic fields or the temperature of the sample. And then uh, I will also consider feedback protocols that turn out to play an important role in this type of, of interaction-based uh, metrology. Okay, so maybe the structure of the talk. First, I will present uh, the main quantities of interest, so measurement precision and, and quantum fish information. Then I will move to this upper bound. So this is actually an uh, unpublished result, okay? So I was hoping it, it would be ready for this talk but okay this never works but i hope in the in the next month or so it should be out and then it's kind of anti-chronological order okay but 
it, it's how it makes more sense to present it, but then I will move on how to engineering optimal probes, and finally uh, <coughs> to feedback control. Okay, so I start for the basics, what are the, what is that the mathematical problem that we have in mind, and the relevant figures of memory. So as I was saying, the idea is that we have a probe that depends on how in a parameter that we want to estimate, and of course we have to measure this probe. So at the end what we have is some data, um, and then, well, a uh, crucial quantity is the estimator, so basically we want a function that you input the data that you have, and it gives you an estimate for the parameter that you want to, to measure. And then you need also a, a quantity that quantifies how good is this estimate, and usually in this you take the mean square error. So this is very also intuitive. Basically you take the difference between your estimate and the real value, you square it, and of course you take the average over, if you want, over many repetitions of experiment uh, of all, all the probabilities. Okay? Now, uh, a kind of crucial, uh, well-known uh, result in metrology is that if you have an unbiased estimator, so this means basically that, that you have a, a good measurement device, okay, so on average, if you would repeat many times, you would get the, the right result. Um, so then the error, so the uncertainty of the measurement that, that you are doing depends on the Fisher information or the classical Fisher information. And now it's nice because for the Fisher information you have a simple uh, expression in terms of the probabilities of getting each of the outcome. Okay, so for each of the measurement outcomes that you can get, you, know, in, you get the probability distribution, and through this you can compute this quantity. And of course these probabilities, they depend on the state of the probe that you are measuring, and on the measurement that you are doing. Okay? So please ask me if there is any question. And now there is a second very important result in quantum uh, metrology, it's the quantum Fisher information, because of course these probabilities depends on the measurement that you are doing. So they depend on the measurement and the state of the probe. Now, you can maximize over all measurements, so you can think, okay, given this state of the probe, which is the optimal measurement that I can do, and if you maximize over all possible measurements, then you find the quantum Fisher information. So the quantum Fisher information, you have a close expression for it, so you don't need to do this maximization. And okay, you can express it in terms of symmetric lorimic derivative. Here, this is not so important. What is important is this inequality, okay? You can bound the precision of your measurement by a quant, so this is the number of measurements that you do, times the quantum Fisher information. And the quantum Fisher information depends on the state Okay, so it's a quantity that you give me a state of the probe, and I tell you in the best case scenario that you use an unbiased estimator and you do use a best measurement, in this best case scenario, what is the minimal possible precision okay, allowed by nature on, on this estimator? Okay? Um, super basic question, I'm confused the link between the data and the, the probe <coughs> between the measurements. Yeah, um, so okay, I didn't write this. But imagine, so here, I didn't put this, sorry, but this x, I'm here assuming that you can take d possible values. Okay. x can take d possible values. Yes, yeah, say, okay, okay, so it's discrete. And then this is the probability of each value. Mm. So this is for one run of, this probability is for one run of experiments. You don't have to, okay, so it's, I, I do my measurement, and I can get d outcomes, okay. And uh, I just look at the probability of each outcome, and then I can compute this feature so information. So x is going to be x one is going to be one of the outcomes. X two is going to be one of the outcomes. X well, no, sorry. So here, x one, x two is the number of me so x one is the first measurement, x two is the second measurement, and you do m measurements. Yeah. Okay. And this you get this m because you are doing m measurements, and each measurement, so x one, you can take d values. Yeah. Okay. So indeed, that's why it's useful, because you don't need to look at many measurements, but just a part. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly go into uh, how to write like, uh, that is, um, the 
uh, how to derive? How to derive uh, the variance uh, squared relation to the this is not bounded by uh, one of the efficient Sorry, I understand. So how the proof works is yes. the question. Yeah, it's quite simple. So you start from this. Uh, okay, I don't remember by heart, but it's Cauchy's bars, as usual. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, you, you yes, you. I think, I'm not sure if you start from this or, or this. It's like more intuitive, like what is the official information, um, like say, in ah. terms of. Yeah. More intuitive, okay, this I wanted to give now, but, uh, okay, I should have put the formula of the official information. So, the official information, you can also related to a distance between states, okay? So basically, it's telling you, when I change a bit this parameter, okay, so if I say I'm measuring the temperature, so when I go from one millikelvin, I change a bit the temperature, how much the state of the probe changes, okay? So you can understand the quantum fish information as a kind of rate or, yeah, as a change, how much the state changes when you change the parameter that you are measuring. <laughs> okay, it's a bit more complicated. I mean, I'm giving intuition, okay? Yes, I mean, you can do it properly. Forget about this formula. This formula, I only wanted to make the point that you can compute it. Uh, for the intuition, it's good to have this idea that it's measuring how you change, but it's not the, just the derivative of the state. What you see here, no, it's a derivative. Okay. Okay, good. So now also uh, going on with your, with your question, um, imagine that now the probe is in a thermal state, okay, in a Gibbs state. Then the <coughs> Fisher information, and this is, okay, it's a technical thing, but it's kind of important. If you have commuting Hamiltonians, okay, so again, everything is classical, like the perturbation that you are, so how you are changing the Hamiltonian, the, it commutes, then you can express the quantum efficient information as a susceptibility, okay? So this is the partition function. So basically it's telling you how much the state changes, for example, when you change uh, the temperature, when you change the magnetic field. So again, it goes back to this question, what is the meaning of the quantum efficient information? Well, it's a response, okay? When I change a bit the parameter that I'm measuring, how much the state changes. Now, once you have this connection to susceptibility, well, it's kind of clear that there is a connection to criticality, right? Because the susceptibility in a phase transition, it can scale like one, well, it can scale super extensively. So these are already showing that even in classical systems, well, this fission information can diverge. And, and this is what we use in measurement, okay? Not in quantum measurement, but in many measurements, you use that. There is a huge change uh, close to a phase transition of the state. And okay, I mean, this is well known. And okay, here, for example, in this paper, they mentioned for quantum metrology. But now, what do we want to do? What, what was it? Yes. So what is the meaning of the commutation relation? Physical? What the, the commutation Well, the meaning of this? Yeah. Okay, it's. Um, it's telling you somehow that when you change, okay, may, may, I don't know if it's what you ask, or it's a, but it's kind of telling you that uh, when you change the parameter, so this probe is in a Gibbs state, so if you want, it's kind of diagonal, and then you change the parameter that you are measuring and it stays diagonal. Well, I don't know if this respo uh, responds to yours. So it this doesn't- This is the interaction. This? this is Hamiltonian. Yes, so it's a property of this Hamiltonian here. So it's so the H of theta. Um, sorry, it's, it should be H of theta, yes. So it's the uh, Hamiltonian that encodes the parameter. Okay? So what is the question that we were interested? Because you see, you have this kind of connections, and okay, I'm not an expert in condensed matter, but usually the critical exponents, okay, I mean, there's a, a deep theory, but it's difficult to find them, and it's you, you need to, okay, it's for a particular, then you can look at different classes, but what we are a bit interested is, okay, what is actually a bit similar to the Heisenberg scheduling? So what is the maximal 
that you can achieve here. So if you, if you instead, you don't go to the macroscopic limit, but you have this probe of a few particles. So you know in principle you can get a collective advantage, but kind of, but what if we can engineer this interaction, okay? How good can we do? If you want this maximal value of x here um, that we can engineer to, to make the most out of this interacting probe. So this is a bit what was our motivation because there's been many papers that kind of use these ideas for, for given systems that you can either analytically solve or, or numerically. But that we were interested a bit to put some bounds on this. And, with and this how reasonable is this assumption of commutativity? Well, uh, like in the sense that for like usual Hamiltonians, do you find? I mean, well, all classical Hamiltonians, so <laughs> so this find this, it's kind of a big class. It becomes classical too short. You just got to only change the eigenvalues. <coughs> yes, yes. I mean, it's not a strong uh, and spin classical model. So this finds this. Uh, And okay, even if, I mean, this I only wanted to give the intuition, okay? Even if this is not satisfied, okay, the expression, mathematical expression is not the same, but the physics are the same, okay? It's still a response, it's just that when you take the derivative, it's more complicated what you get, but it's still a response of your probe to the, and actually the, the question we are asking when we maximize is over all possible quantum or classical process, okay? So I only wrote this because I wanted to give this intuition. In the, what we are asking, of course, we also want to look at quantum. This is part of the motivation. Okay, so I move to the first result. So this is mostly by Paolo Musso, who is a long-term collaborator now in Pochidiesna. And also, okay, thanks to these people. Um, okay, so again, what is the problem that we have in mind? We have a probe at thermal equilibrium with interactions, and now, what we imagine is that this Hamiltonian of the probe, you can divide it in two parts. One that depends on the parameter. So I don't know, for example, imagine you have a magnetic field. So you have a part that depends on the parameter that you are changing. And another that is the control part. So this is the part that you can control. Okay, so you can, I don't know, engineer interactions. You can do changes of the Hamiltonian. But of course, this control part should be independent of what you are measuring. Okay, so and now, okay, it's useful also, it will be useful to think of a Gibbs state that only depends on the control Hamiltonian. <coughs> so where you forget what you are measuring and it only depends on the control. Now, the main result, which is actually quite simple, is the following. Um, so if you maximize this quantum Fisher information over all control Hamiltonians, classical <coughs> and quantum, okay, I'm not making any assumption, then you can rewrite this as follows. Okay. I hope uh, it's, it's clear. So, okay, so here what do we have? We have the change of the Hamiltonian, so it's kind of the perturbation that you are doing, okay? And okay, you evaluate it at, at, t, at theta equals zero. Okay, it's a bit technical, it's just when you do quantum fish information, you can always, it's kind of a local problem. Okay, so you can always think how the state depends around one parameter. And if you, can, if you have full control, basically the rest of the Hamiltonian part, you can move it to the control part. But anyway, if you want, it's just a change of the Hamiltonian. And now, for this, you compute what is the variance, okay, given this operator, for this deep state of the control Hamiltonian. So basically it's kind of intuitive. What you want, is to maximize the variance, so maximize kind of the fluctuations and how this uh, thermal state changes for a given perturbation, okay? And now, so the difficult part is to go from here to here, because basically here you have all the quantum uh, Hamiltonians, here everything is kind of uh, classical. And once you have this, it's kind of simple, because the maximum of the variance, okay, this is given by the, well, basically you take the maximum or the minimum eigenvalues of, of this operator, and it's this squared. Okay, so you have a simple formula for the maximum Fisher information that depends only on the max and minimum eigenvalues of, of the perturbation. 
that you are doing. Okay, so far it's, it's quite mathematical, okay, but you see it's kind of a simple expression for this problem. And now, so we go into some examples that will give some, some idea of the kind of results that we have. <coughs> so let's consider first magnetometry, okay? So you want to measure some magnetic field. So now you have some, some theta, and then again, okay, the problem I've been saying, you have a deep state, you can change the control parameter, now, of course, if you don't have interaction, so if this, okay, say it's zero, then your fish information will scale extensively. But if we apply the formula that I was doing before, what we find is that this maximal fish information goes as n squared times beta squared. And this is kind of a crucial uh, result, and, and, and it's uh, one of the most interesting things, that indeed we can see that even using Gibbs states, we can also get a scaling that goes as n squared, so quadratic, okay? Weighted now by the temperature. Now we can also go to, to another problem, so thermometry. So this formally, okay, it looks similar, but actually in practice quite different because now you want to estimate an overall factor on the Hamiltonian. So basically when you change the control parameter, you are also changing the control Hamiltonian, you are also changing the, the state. So it's the, so basically you get the solution is, is more is more difficult. Okay? You get a nonlinear uh, function that you have to solve numerically. But how would this arise in practice? What? Sorry. Having it out of form. <coughs> like how would that? Well, no. Form? Here, well, I put it here, but formally, what you the idea here would be is you have your sample at temperature beta, say a neutral cold gas, but you don't know it the temperature, and now you use a probe to measure the temperature of the sample, you let the probe relax, and now you want to measure beta. Okay, it's just that to, to be consistent, I'm, I'm putting the, okay, a theta here, but really it's measuring the temperature. It's measuring this beta. But we can see that for n large, we again did this, this get this quadratic scaling, now for temperature estimation, and let me say that by this, we recover some kind of known results in, in quantum thermometry, um, where they look, they were looking, and we were motivated by this. Okay, now it's been eight years, <laughs> but this is a bit how I started getting inter interested in this because they basically found uh, the optimal probe for measuring temperature. So then we started working. I will present it later, but basically now what we have is a generalization of this to all the possible uh, parameters that you would like to measure. Okay? So practice is consistent with, with previous results. And indeed, we can go beyond. No? You can use any parameter that you want. I don't know, you want to estimate some interactions. And if you estimate the directions, you see this goes as n to the fourth. So just to say there is nothing special about the quadratic scaling. So you get quadratic scaling where what you are measuring is kind of a local observable. But if you would measure interactions, um, then you can go beyond. This also happens, by the way, in, in more standard quantum methodology. Okay? So yeah, I hope I gave you a bit of an idea. So we have this general maximization, and then we can apply it to your, your favorite uh, estimation problem. So now let me give you some, some physical insights. One about what we were saying before, OK? So non kind of quantum, meaning non-commuting, versus commuting from Hamiltonians. So one crucial part of the proof is actually to show that in this first step, what you show is that you want to have commuting Hamiltonians. Okay. So, so really, in this um, metrological problem, there is no quantum advantage in the more general case. Okay. So with classical systems, you can saturate all these upper bounds, like classical, meaning uh, commuting Hamiltonians. We do get an advantage, though, when we consider gapped systems. Okay, so if the probe that you are taking uh, is gapped, then uh, we do see a, a gain by exploiting uh, quantum coherence. And, okay, I try to give an intuition. So for classical systems, it's kind of clear that, well, 
what, so basically you have a diagonal state, right? And, and the populations of these excited states it decrease exponentially, or at least exponentially with the gap. So whatever you do, you will always get that you are exponentially suppressed. So when you go to zero temperature, this population goes to zero, and, and there's it. No, there's not much more to it. But with quantum systems, you can be a bit smarter, because you can start considering superpositions of states uh, between the ground state and, and some states here, so that, OK, basically, you have two different states that, uh, OK, even if strictly they will converge, they, they are orthogonal. Okay. And OK, you see that you can get a better decay that goes uh, like 1 over the gap square. So the moment, actually, you start considering gap systems, you have an exponential quantum advantage. Okay? So, so there is this, this double message that no quantum advantage in general, but actually a big quantum advantage for, for gap. Uh, yes. OK. I mean, there is something uh, also funny about this result. Well, first, <coughs> Okay, note that, of course, if the temperature is finite of the environment, then it's nice. So we have a bound on the precision with whatever measurement you do. But of course, as you take the temperature to zero, in principle, what this result is telling you is that there is no limit on the quantum Fisher information. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So you can imagine that you ca could prepare two states, and okay, it's kind of a superposition of being in the ground state and, and some other state, and okay, by playing with <coughs> the phases of these states, these two states can be orthogonal. Okay, so you can um, distinguish them very well, but both of them, okay, they are they have a finite contribution. Right? Okay. So even when you go to very low temperatures, both of them, they are orthogonal, but they are still populated. So that's a bit what you exploit. Whereas classically, that you cannot play with these propositions. Thank you. So, OK, this is indeed a bit, um, it can okay, make fe one feel a bit uneasy, because, I mean, we still, it kind of opens interesting questions, okay? Because it, if we can really get infinite fish information, this doesn't look very physical, okay? So it, it opens interesting questions. Like, for example, it, you can say, what does this tell us about the time of thermalization, okay? Because we are assuming I'm always in a Gibbs state, and this seems a very natural assumption, and so on. But okay, maybe. I mean, we know that when you go to very low temperatures, it's not such a natural assumption. Okay? So it, it opens interesting questions. And also, how is this compatible with the uh, results I was mentioning at the beginning, okay? with Heisenberg's bound, which is always finite. I mean, it never diverges. Okay, so for this, it's very interesting to, to kind of compare what I've been doing, this kind of thermal metrology, to coherent, to, to standard uh, dynamical metrology, okay? So just a quick recap. Yeah, I hope it's not too fast, but usually in quantum metrology, what people have in mind is that you prepare some state, it can be a highly entangled state, and now you let this state evolve under a Hamiltonian that depends on the parameters that you want to stimulate, okay? So it's very natural. You have your atomic state, and you put a magnetic field, you let it evolve, and then you measure it, and then you measure the quantum fission energy. And the Heisenberg limit, what it tells you, if you are using measuring a magnetic field here, it tells you that the quantum fission information <coughs> can go at most like time squared times n squared. Okay? And this is a very fundamental reason. Okay? It also holds for interacting systems. It holds for any control Newtonian here. Okay, this is very, it's always true, mathematically, quantum, classical, interacting, non-interacting. Okay, so this you can also always take it as a, as a yeah, result with no assumptions, almost, okay, under this picture. And now we have this kind of simpler 
approach where you say, ah, okay, I just assumed that my probe is in a thermal state, and now I was showing this result. Okay? Now, in a way, you can think of this as a subcase of this, right? Because at least if, okay, I'm not getting too much into details, but you could, in this control, I mean, you could even think that you have an environment. I mean, you can keep it everything uh, quite general. And you could think that, in a way, this evolution is bringing you to the thermal state. Okay, I mean, if you reach a thermal state, this should come from some evolution. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be consistent, you would like that this is always bigger than this. Okay? But it's clear that it seems that for betas big enough, there might be an inconsistency. Well, but if you impose this, what you get is that the equilibration time, okay, the time that you require to get this Gibbs state is bounded, and maybe there's a refactor here, but by this quantity. Beta times h bar, okay, so it's a bit small. What is very interesting of this observation is that this time scale is known actually, and it's an important quantity that's known as Planckian time or Planckian dissipation. <coughs> so it's this quantity, okay, that I was mentioning. So it's basically a ratio between uh, h bar and kBT, okay, so by kind of quantum and thermal uh, fluctuations. And uh, it's kind of believed, and okay, there are many uh, results about this, but that, that this is a minimal time for thermalization. So we see kind of indirectly that we get a nice connection between these results because for consistency, we need indeed that this is true, right? That this is a minimum time to reach thermalization. Okay, so this kind of a nice uh, observation. Now, more in practice, if you want to compare these two approaches, what you would compare is a bit, okay, to get this Heisenberg scaling, what I require is that all the dynamics take coherent, okay, so I have always quantum entanglement or quantum coherence, so what I care about is coherence time, whereas here what I care is how long it takes me to, to equilibrate. I mean, you can put some numbers, and for example, I don't know, if you take the coherence time of one millisecond, uh, temperature of one millikelvin, you see that actually this approach, I mean, this fish information is orders of, here five orders of, I mean, you can of course play with this, this is just some reasonable parameters, but it's five orders of magnitude than the other one, okay? Um, but okay, I mean, still, you can argue that in, in several situations this can be interesting. Well, first of all, because here to increase n is much harder than here, right? Here you just have a classical system or at least a priori seems much harder to increase n than here. And also the other thing is that, I mean, this difference is when you really care about time. But maybe for you to do the probe, like to, to do the measurement, you don't care if it takes longer than one millisecond. Okay, so it could be that in some practical situations, you are okay sacrificing a bit of uh, being slowly, but at the, what you gain really is a kind of an easier approach to to collective methodology, let's say. Okay. Yes? You said that TPM is a um, short extent in the thermalized system. Yes. But maybe in the real system, the thermalization is given by the SDK. Of course, yeah, yeah. This is kind of, uh, yes, yes, of course. And this is a very interesting question. Like, you would like to, in general, understand um, how this system reaches a thermal state, right? This is a it, it huh? it yes, it can become, yes, it could become slow and, okay, this is an interesting question that also we want to investigate a bit how it relates these more collective advantages to, to time scale of, of thermalization. Okay? But this a bit brings us the question <coughs> of, because we know that to reach this, Okay, we understand well, we need GHZ state, we need entangled state, but it's not so clear what we need to reach this thermal bound. And this is a bit what I uh, wanted to address in what follows. Basically, because all the optimizations, they are done about an arbitrary control Hamiltonian. 
So in principle, you could think that, okay, this here you have two body terms, I mean, okay, one body terms, two body, but also three body, four body, and so on. So it could be that actually it's very hard to get this m squared in practice. So what we've been looking at is how much can you get with two body interactions, okay? So and uh, it turns out that when you look at uh, magnetometry at the fields, you can saturate it with uh, quite a simple uh, measurement. So imagine a situation that you just have two control parameters. Okay, one is that you can kind of correct the field that you are measuring. I mean, this is quite standard in, in at least local estimation because you assume that you more or less know what you want to measure, but you just want to measure small, like with a lot of detail. Uh, these parameters, so you could think that okay, you can more or less correct to the right point, and then you can also add some interactions. Okay. Now, if you look at the proof, well, first again, everything is classical here. Now, if you want to see what what is the step that brings you to here, here, as I said, what you want basically is you want to prepare a mixture of the state with the maximal and minimal eigenvalue of, of the perturbation, okay? So here, if you take, um, well, H, like the derivative with respect, basically, you, we just have SZ. So basically, what you want is a mixture of all the spins pointing up or all the spins pointing down, okay? And this you can just get by strong ferromagnetic interaction, right? So if you make this, this term very strong, and also you choose this so <coughs> that this term is close to zero, okay, then clearly you have what you want, right? When you make J strong enough, you will have two possible ground states. So either all down or all up. So you will get the state that you want. And of course, in practice, the question is how strong needs to be J? So these are some, some simulations for the N. And basically what you see is that Okay, roughly speaking, when j is the order of one, then you saturate to this, okay, to this m squared, so to this maximal value. Uh, more strictly speaking, you can see that j has to scale like logarithm of n, which of course is not great because we would like something that, okay, where these are independent of n, but okay, it's logarithmically, so you can think that. It might be that for finite n, you can kind of engineer these, these optimal probes. And then I move to the, the, the okay, second part of the talk, which is how to reach this m squared with, uh, when you want to measure the temperature. Okay? So again, this, we started working on this problem by, by looking at temperature, actually. Um, so again, the question is the same. So you want, again, to saturate this bound by um, preparing some, some deep state. But here you see it's more subtle, because when, when you take the derivative with respect to theta, the thermal state that you get also depends on the, on the control Hamiltonian. Okay? So it's kind of a nonlinear thing. So it's, it's harder to see what is the, before it was very simple, but here it's harder to see what is the optimal Hamiltonian. But okay, we have the solution since a few years, and what they found in this article is that if you have a D-level Hamiltonian to build this optimal thermometer, it's kind of a funny structure where you have a ground state, and then all the other levels are condensed, so you have a highly degenerate first excited state. Okay, so this really looks highly uh, non- uh, <laughs> non-local, okay, it's a very, very fine-tuned uh, Hamiltonian. So it's quite unclear how you would achieve this, say, with two-body interactions. And this is the problem that we were interested in. So how to get, say, close to this Hamiltonian with only two-body interactions. Well, it's kind of known that if you want to exactly get this, you need n-body interactions, okay, so you need, ah, so you have and uh, spins, you need all of them interacting uh, simultaneously. Okay, and this, it was a long search, 
also numerically, but okay, at the end we got kind of a good understanding, and here I only summarized the results. <coughs> um, well, okay, this is the, this is a bit the summary of all the results. So here in red, you have this upper bound, okay? So this is this m squared, this is a log log plot. Now, the kind of control that we assume is you have, you can change the local fields and you also can, ch you can choose the interactions between two bodies as you want, okay? You can do none, I mean, it doesn't need to be 1D or 2D. First, you can take a known model, so if you take 1D ice thing as before, that this was optimal. Well, here it's not, here you see that it just is, uh, I think it's, well, is one the I think so it's this one so it just goes linear with n even if you go to 3, 2d or 3d you are still far from this n squared that we would like okay I think models they don't really work here you can try all to all but again it doesn't work it works for very small n it's quite good but again it's linear eventually and then okay using more or less advanced numerical tools, what we could find is uh, this star, I mean, it's, it's quite simple, okay, when you know it, but it was hard to find. But it, it turns out that this star Hamiltonian, okay, where you have a uh, central spin coupled to many, uh, to all the rest of the spins, and if you choose properly the interactions and, uh, and the local fields, it turns out that you can, when n is large, you can get this n squared behavior. Okay, so this was kind of the main result that we <coughs> could see that with two ball interactions in this task of thermometry, we can get very close to this highly, yes. So are you recreating the energy eigenvalue yes. structure that you have? Yes, so yes. Doing if, you ch if you okay. check the energy structure, you see that there's a huge degeneracy. You can see more or less uh, if you spend some time. Yeah. And then, okay, we were also interested to understand, because this is two-body, but of course very non-local, so we were interested to understand if you could do it in a more uh, local <coughs> way. And the answer, again, is yes. So you can keep this m squared with a factor, basically, that weights, okay, it kind of weights how non-local it is, if you want, okay? So when m uh, goes to n, then you, you just get 1. And the smaller is m is, the, the bigger you have a, a correction. OK? Um, yes. OK, then maybe I. Mm -hmm. You said that you need a degenerate speed. Yes. And you can control the, all the frequency independently. You know, yes. Why don't you just no, no. Okay, if you put, if you have a non-interacting, well, you see the spectra will be, well, you will have a typical, what is it, a Gaussian or a... Yeah, but you, you can control the energy huh? one by one. You can control the energy. Yeah, but you see, if you, can, if you don't have interactions, everything will be extensive, right? It's impossible that you can get something that goes <coughs> like n squared or so if you have independent particles. What you want really here is the first excited level is all the energy levels. That, I mean, you have n, n spins, you have n possible energy levels, right? You have one excitation, two excitations, three excitations, and all with different degeneracies. And okay, at the end you get that it's extensive with n, right? right. Here, you really what you want is that in the first excited level, you have all that, so it's a highly so if you, have, you don't have interaction, the first excitation will be just in the states. In yes, okay. exactly. But you need an exponential number of states there. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So 15 minutes, but maybe try and do 10 minutes. I, I try to go fast, yeah. So this, okay, it's not uh, so. And then, well, okay, quickly I, I finish the last part. So it's about feedback control. I will go fast here. Okay, here the idea is very simple. I hope we are not all too tired. So the idea here is that, okay, we want to exploit these this phase transitions, but what happens is that the point where this fission information uh, um, uh, grows, let's say quadratically, 
Well, this point, you see, it, I mean, it, it's just a point, right? It, 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 it uh, like the region <coughs> where the quantum fish information has this scaling, it's a very fine-tuned uh, region. But the problem is that, I mean, it also depends on the parameter that you want to estimate. So it's like, I don't know how to say it, but it's like, you want to estimate something that you don't know, but then you have to prepare your probe close to a phase transition, quantum phase transition, but preparing the probe depends on the parameter that you want to observe. So it's kind of, <laughs> and this is well known, okay, this problem in, in, uh, in, uh, in quantum metrology, okay, it's well known that, okay, here it's probably better explained, so which maximizes the fish information, typically depends on the true unknown state of the quantum system. And this is a kind of an apparent loophole which is closed, blah, blah, but basically what usually people consider is this two-stage adaptive uh, method where you would spend some measurements just to know more or less what is your unknown parameter and then for the rest of the measurements you do your entangled or, or critical presentation and so this kind of solves the, the question in principle but here we were interested to improve on this um, adaptive protocol because in critical metrology it's really crucial that you have this feedback and adaptivity so okay this is just a single trajectory but you can really see that you gain order of magnitude in precision by exploiting feedback so okay these are just some results um, and basically what we see so this is this two-step protocol that I was mentioning and the kind of protocols that we consider is this fully adaptive one so you can see that you can really go much better if you if you don't take this naive two-step protocol, but but you do something more more elaborate. Okay, so this is a very brief summary <coughs> of this last part, which is basically the idea of exploiting feedback properly for this uh, critical methodology. And maybe I this case, and I go a bit to the outlook. So I think. What is most interesting in the future for me is to, so now we have kind of two extremes, right? We have the well-known uh, high standard methodology <coughs> where you need dedicated quantum states, and we have this now very classical. Um, so it's very interesting to understand a bit what is in between, okay? So how to move from one to the other, and what are the physical implications that, um, so this is something that, that we are very interested in the future. Maybe let me mention that Ricard, uh, <laughs> he's here, uh, has also worked in his master's thesis uh, on this part. Okay, so we were hoping like, to find also to kind of see some quantum phase transition by optimizing this. So far, uh, <laughs> we were not very lucky, but I think we are only grasping the surface. Um, yes, and um, with this, I go to the summary. So in the first part, I, I showed this fundamental bound, okay, which is for uh, thermal uh, probes. And basically what we saw is that there is a quantum advantage, but only for gap probes. Otherwise, actually, you also can get this with classical systems. And that there's, as I was saying, there's a very interesting interplay between this dynamical and also thermal metrology. In the second part of the talk, I discussed how to get close to these bounds with two-body interactions. And at the end, I quickly went through the feedback control. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. Does anyone have any questions for Martin? This is for uh, the thing you said that you um, consider kind of the worst case um, most in the case. Um, yes. Um, so how would you um, model um, like other, let's say, states that are more um, prone to critical, so, or more having less entropy, let's say? Yeah, yeah well, uh, okay, I was a bit, uh, I mean, it relates a bit what I was saying before, no? It would be nice a bit to see what is a bit in between, because now I feel we have the two extremes, but of course there's a lot of interesting. But what are like, um, let's say, magnetic, magnetic tools to describe, I, I mean, 
Well, okay, I think there's many studies that are interesting, for example, people are looking at dissipative phase transition, so here you would not get go to a deep state, but to a state that depends more on the driving that you are doing. And so, okay, I, I don't know, it's hard to make a short question, but basically there's, yes, and, and you can use similar tools, and all these tools of quantum fish information and so on that I presented, they are completely general. You have some interesting uh, model. Or but would you, uh, would you expect like that uh, scaling would be, um, like say, um, better? With, um, well, better, no. Because yeah. that's what the point of it of this talk was to get the optimal, right? The scaling. So this was. So we know for uh, we know Heisenberg is always true, and then here, okay, it was uh, for for thermal probes. But okay, you will always eventually be limited by Heisenberg. Okay, so there's actually, you said actually it's interesting to look at these states, but actually you don't expect um, to get more knowledge out of them? Well, uh, so I'm interested in, as I was saying, in this interplay. I mean, this is always true. Okay. Now we have, under some assumptions, this bound that has its advantages. Um, okay, because you use simpler states. And the point is, this is always true, and it's a fundamental amount, but it's very hard to get there, OK? So it's very hard to prepare a GLJ state, because there is noise, and, and so on. So, so I think what is interesting is to understand more practical ways to get uh, collective advantages in metrology. So is it the general question? Um, so here we are treating data as Purely classical quantum. Okay. Yeah. Um, but in reality, for example, mm -hmm. if it's a magnetic field, it has its own Hamiltonian and it's living in its own uh, yes. field space. Yes. Yes. Um, can you comment on that? Because yeah, that definitely yeah. goes more limits. Yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting. Uh, okay. So I don't want to get too fundamental, but I guess <laughs> eventually what you're estimating a parameter. I mean, it will still be a parameter, right? It will still be something classical. But what is true is that, of course, here I was kind of, in the magnetic field case, I was using kind of a semi-classical approximation, OK, where this is a parameter of Hamiltonian. But in reality, you have what have some coupling to the field, which is covered by subtract. And this is a very interesting. Yes, uh, I think this discussion about the commutation with the, the yes, 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 it's, it's actually related mm -hmm. to this. Yes, I agree. Because yeah. theta, if it was an operator, this yeah. was very non-trivial. Because yes. the commutation implies that h theta commutes with h any other theta. Yes. Um, ex so and exactly this brings the mm -hmm. you know other concepts in quantum metrology like the you know. Mm -hmm. Quantum back action, for example. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, no. I think these are all very yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all very interesting questions. Yeah. Uh, Indeed, uh, at the moment you have a purely quantum. Um, so I would expect kind of Heisenberg will still be there. Well, okay, but no, I agree. It's, uh, I think it's we have some uh, specific ideas on this, like like when you do web metrology, but in a fully quantum setup, right? Where you say you have a sample. It's merely you have a sample, but you want to estimate some parameter, and you use another probe, but everything is quantum. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So it's is it correct if I say this formalism um, <coughs> is relevant to problems similar to LIGO, for example, that the actual system is so far and we don't uh, talk to it? And it, for us, it's uh, basically classical. Basically, semi, as you said, semi classical interactions between the. Yes. How do you call the, the probe and the system? Yeah, and the sum. Okay. Yes, yes. Sum. Yes, right. <coughs> yes. yes. Yeah, for it was always right from the very beginning. It, the parameter was encoded in the Hamiltonian. So yeah, so this would be a very interesting uh, future direction. Okay. I have a question about the scheme. Do you estimate the theta? You need to precisely know the temperature of the system. Of the environment. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Part of the talk was also about when this theta is the temperature. So you could also think. I mean, it's always the setup is that you don't know one parameter. In principle, this parameter could also be the temperature. The temperature is for your skin. Do you need to 
Uh, no. Yes. Yes. The idea is that you would have some control at the beginning, prepare your pro as an interacting system, and then you can use it as many times as you want. Unless, so this is in the case that you have a good prior knowledge. If not, then you need feedback, and this feedback is in the interactions. Information is a maximization over PLMs. Quantum fish information okay. over PLMs. Yes. Um, wait, wait. We, we, you were dealing with the quantum fish information. Yes. yes. So I guess we didn't. Do you I know what the PLMs look like? The one that maximizes. Good. Out? Very good question. Thank okay. you. I should have said that. It's okay because everything, since everything is classical, basically you need just local measurements. I should have said it. Okay. So it's just local spin measure. And yeah, so with local inductions and local measurements. Sorry, I forgot to discuss the measurement. But it's, it's very... And the bound that you have in the... So it's always local yes. measurements. Yes, I think so. At least for the applications, for sure. I don't know if you can find some weird... Uh, it could be that if you want to measure, I don't know, the traction strength. Then you <coughs> I'm not sure. So for the typical applications, yes. Uh, in general... I want to see. How would you figure it out? You would actually have to do the operation well, yourself, or is there like a constructive way of figuring There's it out? a constructive. Okay. So this thing that I showed of how to compute the quantum fish information, mm -hmm. like this symmetric law limiting derivative, yeah. this gives you the optimal measure. Okay. In the context of chaos, you have uh, yakunaps that are bounded by this inverse of time scale. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Is there a simple relation between Yakunov's and Fisher information? Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, question. It's something that uh, yeah we want to also look at. Uh, because indeed, as I was saying, this appears in many contexts. OK, it would be nice to understand a bit more. Yeah. Oh. But it's similar, sorry. No. <laughs> because at the end, it's also how, right? The quantum <coughs> I mean, it's this idea of when you change a bit, how ma how far they are. Okay, so clearly the. Yeah. I was going to say we were bad on time. <laughs> so, but are there any more questions? If not, let's thank Marty again. <laughs>